I hope everybody had a good night. And if you went to the public event, that you enjoyed that, um, that you're refreshed and ready to go into another day of discussions today. Um, I was reflecting last night, you know, on the last past five years or so of, of our gatherings um, at these meetings, and thinking, you know, five years ago, we had just a fraction of the number of folks who were able to join us this week. And um, it's just so thrilling, I think, for Julie and I to see how this sort of um, organic energy has come together to foster these really important collaborations. And we're really thrilled to have everybody here, all of you, joining us to build this, this knowledge and action capacity in this network. Um, so we just we can't express how grateful we are for all of you to be joining us. And uh, today we have another full agenda. Um, so we will start off again with some presentations and then move again into our discussion groups. And as we said, you know, those conversations about knowledge and knowledge capacity and what it means to collaborate will flow into conversations about what actions then come out of these collaborations, meaningful actions that um, enact real changes in our world. So I wanted to um, mention a couple of things. I wanted to, you know, in, in the spirit of that, you know, flowing into the actions that are meaningful in our world, really thank uh, Suzanne and all everybody here from Cultural Survival. And really, it was Cultural Survival who was able to um, buy us pizza last night. So thank you so much. And being able to have that international perspective that we're able to have because of cultural survival joining us this year, I think you know it's it's invaluable. I'm still struggling to find the words, so um, thank you again for being here. Um, a couple of quick announcements. There are some Cosmic Serpent books. Cosmic Serpent was another um, uh, effort that was National Science Foundation funded a few years ago as well, and there, one of their outcomes were these amazing books. You may have some delivered to you, otherwise there may still be some on the tables outside in the lobby. Um, Laura Petrocolis sent a couple boxes of those books to me, hoping that I would distribute them here. Please take them with you. They are very heavy books when you have three boxes of them. Individually, not so bad, so <laughs> please, I think they're, they're beautiful books. Please take those. Um, there are a couple of folks in the room, I think, who were involved in that, those workshops. Um, yeah, I, but I'm not seeing him stepped out. Anyway, um, a couple people were involved in that, so you know, feel free to get their stories of that experience as well. Um, let's see. I want to remind folks to please um, do the social network analysis that Carla is working on and the evaluation questions at the end. Um, Carla, this afternoon, as we're closing, will be in this corner of the, the um, room. So if you haven't found her before, please hand the papers to her then. I believe that's what she wanted me to say. Um, or tomorrow morning. Oh, there you are. OK, yes, yes, or tomorrow morning, whenever you're finished and feel like you've been able to complete it. Um, and I want to give Bob a moment to share something with everybody. It's illustrated. So here's your illustration. How many people were not able to join us at the public event last night? Oh, OK. Um, well, give you a very quick piece. We're doing a webinar series called Applying Indigenuity through IPCCWG, the Indigenous Peoples Climate Change Working Group. And uh, we have seminar every middle Wednesday of the month, as best we can keep it to that kind of a date. And we're looking at best practices throughout uh, Indigenous America. Um, it's, it's funded by the BIA, so it's tribal best practices. But we know that um, federally recognized tribalism is one form of tribalism. And there are many state recognized tribes and other indigenous peoples involved. So we've had these webinars. We've had a lot of people handling some of the main issues facing Indian country and indigenous America. Um, and we have this one coming up on the 19th. So uh, you can go on Facebook, Applying Indigenuity, and um, or we'll be able to, if you, ha if you don't get a notice for these, let me know. We'll add your, add your email address to the, to the piece. Um, 
We've been looking at the, the issue, and I hope it comes up in the breakout groups, of if we can't talk about climate easily under this administration, how can we refrain some of these things, looking at adaptation, looking at dealing with natural disasters? We've, we've had those discussions. Um, but let's get those into the recommendations. I wanted to put this up for just a second. If you haven't gotten one of these, let's make sure you do. Um, Bo Bennett uh, wants to wear these riding his motorcycle, and if anybody asks him about climate change while he's riding his Harley, he can just take his bandana out, show him this diagram, and talk about what it, what it means for an average cha a change in average temperature by just a degree or two. So I want you all to be aware of that, and uh, we've got some more of the bandanas out in the back. And I've asked, uh, had a little con conference with Greg Holland this morning, and he will touch on the, again, we're plagued. Every time we come up with a really good graphic, it's dated, and it's too conservative, and that's why the models don't seem to be predicting things in the time frame we're working on, because science is just so darn conservative. But if only the conservatives would pay attention to that, we'd be in good shape. So I want to just leave you with that. And anybody who didn't make the NDPTC trainings earlier this week, we want to do them at the National uh, Adaptation Forum. And we can also bring them to communities, to your communities, through FEMA, free of charge. So thank you. Thank you for that time. And now I'd love to have Suzanne come up and um, share just a couple words for our sort of motivation or charge for today. Good morning. And welcome today to a Rising Voices. I hope everyone rested well last night and after a very long but engaging day. In I'd like to just sort of recap uh, yesterday as we listened to excellent presentations on the work we are doing locally and ways in which we are bringing this work into larger circles um, to influence policy uh, uh, agencies and, and so forth. Last night when Christina Koch noted that the day on the Mayan calendar was a day of women's energy and power, I realized um, that all of our presenters yesterday were women. <laughs> and um, that wasn't by an intentional design. I think as we just were looking at the agenda and um, thinking about um, who, who, wants to, who has something to say and wants to say this and what we'd like to accomplish. That's just the way uh, the lineup occurred. So we are very appreciative to listen to uh, Shannon and the work on the National Climate Assessment, to uh, Carla Dillon's work on social network analysis, to the collaborative research discussions, to the international presentations on making links from the local initiatives to international mobilization. All these presentations were both very poignant and affirming of why we do this work. The women who, in the audience who asked the question of how do we keep doing this, where do we find the strength, the hope, and the resilience, was a very important question for all of us. Um, I, th I think that is a question that we ask all the time along the way and that we find the answers throughout our journey of doing this work because many of us have been in this for a very, very long time, actually our entire lifetimes. And uh, we continually ask those questions in the face of the challenges. But even last night, as at least I finally got home late in the evening and listened to the news, I, I thought about our um, our current administration and the time we now live in and the very serious challenges to the work we are trying to do. I heard on the news that the US drops the mother of all bombs. 
on Afghanistan, that was my first gasp. The president says he gives the military complete authorization, my second gasp. And a senior defen defense official says, more should not be read into this. Sometimes a bomb is just a bomb. Pass out at that point. I just, this is why this work is so important for us. And last night in the evening event, Kalani remind us, reminded us of what resilience means, what it means to get back up and walk each time we get knocked down. Uh, as indigenous peoples, we are resilient peoples. Last night, Christina spoke of the Western narrative of the Maya people disappearing and extinction. And she says, I am still here. As we close last evening's night panel, and as indigenous peoples do, we found the laughter to lighten our spirits, the ability to not take ourselves too seriously as we poked fun at each other. I kept thinking, surely Coyote was in the room last night. Um, so it was a good day. Uh, today we have much work to do as we focus on developing pathways to collaborative action. The discussion started in the breakout groups yesterday, and my observation is throughout the hour and a half, they continued to deepen and focus. So we'll pick up that work today. And there, there's a couple of objectives around that work. One is truly the sharing of our experiences, our expertise, the work we do in our communities with each other, both domestically and internationally. But as well, uh, we're working towards developing um, recommendations that are mutually agreed upon by this group that become statements in various outcome documents. So that's why the recording um, of the uh, discussions are so important. And we'll have a working group tonight that begins to compile all of that for tomorrow's uh, um, discussion. I hope that we can see the film that Ava has produced, Protect Our Public Lands, today. Look forward to seeing that. And um, I also want to give special thank you to the interpreters who um, are working throughout the day. They're providing excellent translation. That is very truly difficult work and tiring work to do. So thank you, Elena and... Um, Thank you. So let's have good thoughts today and good conversations. We'll continue. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, now I would love to have Greg Holland come up. Um, he is the director of the Capacity Center for Climate and Weather Extremes at NCAR. And you know, when I first joined, I, I first joined NCAR in Greg's group, and he had intentionally put together in one hallway hydrologist, meteorologist, climatologist, engineer, statistician, modeler, and a, so, and a environmental anthropologist. And you know, the rest of NCAR kind of looked at him like, well, how's this going to work? You know? And we have this amazing, dynamic, wonderful, interdisciplinary group that brings together you know, or, um, networks and communities like this. And so thank you so much, Greg, for your support of Rising Voices. And we'll hear from you now. Thanks. Heather, where is it on here? You know where it is? Oh, you know where it is there? While we're waiting for Heather, um, firstly, thank you all for coming. And I apologize about not being here yesterday, but unfortunately, uh, in these sort of interesting times, my uh, schedule doesn't belong to me anymore. Uh, I do have to say that um, this is the fifth Rising Voices workshop I've been to, and it's really, really good to actually see the, uh, the amount of support that comes to the workshop, but also the amount of, of, of work that keeps going. Uh, it was a sort of a bit of an idea in my head before Heather arrived, and when Heather arrived, she turned a sort of a weird idea into something, along with Julie and Bob and others. And, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't realize that, yeah. She turned that into reality, they turned that into reality, 
And now we actually have this, and it's gone through um, into extra funding and such, and I think that really um, is both those three people, thank you, and, uh, and also Caroline Brinkworth. And I'd just like to say thank you, because I've had a hell of a good time. So what I'm going to talk about today is the, um, the Capacity Centre for Climate and Weather Extremes. And basically, uh, when we first got going, you were in the, uh, the mesoscale and microscale meteorology laboratory and in the regional climate uh, group. We've evolved a long way, as you've evolved, uh, to now we have a multidisciplinary, multicultural uh, centre that we've established, and, uh, and I'll come back to how I hope that you can interact with us even more as we go on. As Heather said, it has an interesting Tower of Babel group of people in the sense that there is a really wide range of people involved directly in it, and we have an even wider range of people who are actually partners and uh, working on that. So let me see, show you where it all fits. Um, you all know Rising Voices. Uh, you're actually in here along with uh, two other groups. The first one is in, in engineering the engineering, oh, golly. the engineering for Climate Extremes Partnership, I'm getting too old and too many flights, uh, Engineering for Climate Extremes Partnership, which actually Rising Voices folks have been in a partner on for, uh, since its beginning as well. And the other one is the Global Risk Resilience and Impacts Toolbox. And I think you're, most of you are familiar with the first two, so I'm actually going to go to the, uh, to the last one here and spend uh, this talk uh, giving you a bit of an idea on that because I think there is real benefits and possibilities for us to actually interact there. Since I put this slide up, let me, and I'm going to start showing uh, graphs and things, let me just go back to Bob's earlier comment as well. He made the comment that, you know, if you look on this, uh, this, this lovely uh, bandana, that you've got a distribution like that and you shift it off like this and where is the biggest change? It's in the extremes and the IPC said that and various others have said that. It turns out that um, now we know a lot more about what's happening. That's actually a conservative estimate whereas when it first came out it was thought to be a not conservative estimate. The reason it's conservative is in some cases such as tropical cyclones, this is the original profile. The profile now looks like this, and it's actually grown a bump out there. So it's not like it's just coming down anymore, it's got a bump in it. The second one is some work that's been done by a number of people, including a, a really bright young fellow in, in our group, and that is that you're looking at one bit. What happens when you add all the other bits? And if you think about rainfall in the United States, the contaminous United States, uh, the intensity of the rain goes up, goes out a little bit, the size of the, of the intense rainfall systems goes up, it goes out a bit further, and they are slowing down. So whereas just say the intensity would have improved, in, increased the rainfall by maybe 30%, that's bad news, you put all those three together and it's actually now 100%. So we're not talking about small events anymore, we're talking about doubling the number of intense rainfall occurrences uh, and in the terms of volume, because everything is bigger, uh, when it gets into a river, it's not just simply a little bit of water coming off a mountain, it's now a lot of water coming off the whole catchment. So these are the sorts of things we have to deal with, and it's a pity in this day and age that it's so hard to convince some non-believers. I think, given that, um, there is no doubt that uh, we're seeing changes, you're seeing changes, but I just thought I'd show up the world. This is the entire, uh, this is um, natural catastrophes for the world defined by Munich Re. This is their definition and I've seen other papers that say you'd actually double this number if you actually take all, all um, uh, societal catastrophes. And we have the, what's uh, showing over here, you've got, um, uh, the colours have all got messed up. So uh, this is geophysical, this is weather, this is hydrological and this is climate up on here. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can see everything is going up, and the total totality, except for geophysical, that's earthquakes and such, and the totality is going up. And it shows no inclination of going down, and given what I just said, it is going to continue going up. So we have a problem, it's getting worse. What we need to do is something to actually at least slow that down and hopefully reverse it. 
And that's what the GRIT, or the Global Risk, Resilience and Impacts Toolbox is about. Firstly, um, it's, it's there as a community tool. It's there for you to use and actually for you to contribute to. So what we're hoping to do, no, actually what we're already starting to do, is we're showing how to increase resilience, and we even have some cases where that's actually demonstrably occurring. How to improve planning, that is demonstrably occurring in a number of areas. And to support things like relocation or, uh, or expansion. In other words, uh, if you've got to do something, then let's at least make you help you make the right decisions. Uh, it hasn't gone into that area yet, but uh, I certainly hope that it does. The way that it works is we have a, um, a toolbox which consists of, uh, uh, I'll start at the bottom, of data. We already have access to a really large number of data. I'd love to see um, traditional knowledge information coming into there as well, but that's at your discretion. We have an engine which we're, we have a very basic engine and it's nowhere near good enough, so we're actually working now, which is why I was late yesterday. I didn't get in yesterday as we're trying to get the funding to build that engine, so it can actually do all the work and you don't have to worry about it. You ask it a question, it gives you an answer, a little bit like Google. And the final thing is community tools, and this is where you come in. We've developed a few, and I'll show you a couple of examples, but our whole goal is that the community will develop their own tools and we'll just install them on here, and they, therefore you have them for your own use. So I really put out a challenge. If you've got some ideas, especially the young folks, if you've got some ideas and you think you can come up with a good tool to go in here, you'll get a very receptive audience. Let me just show you three tools. Quickly, this, is done, this was done uh, for the US construction industry and um, this actually is applicable anywhere on Earth and it applies to temperature, rain and wind. And what we've done is we've uh, remapped the information to counties in this case, because that was what the request was. And you can see the, uh, the, the changes in, uh, sorry, the, you can see the, the, by the colors what's happening. There is some stuff up in the top right there that you can't see, unfortunately. But uh, this is the number of days above 30 degrees C. You could have picked 35, you could have picked 30 to 40, you could have picked minus 20. I mean, it doesn't matter what you pick. Um, and it actually then gives you the number of days, and this is the average number of days. We can, you click another bit, and it gives you the maximum number of days, the minimum number of days, the full distribution, whatever you want to get. And this is not just simply past data, this is actually a seasonal forecast for next summer. This is now up there and, uh, and ready to run, and uh, it has quite, quite excellent graphics thanks to a partnership with, uh, with Tableau Cool. You can go across there and pick on any one of those counties, and I've just arbitrarily got uh, Santa Clara here. Santa Clara County, and up comes the information for Santa Clara. You click on another one, up comes the distribution for Santa Clara, not the whole United States now, it's the actual, uh, just the Santa Clara, and all that information is there. Now eventually we'll come down to smaller areas, but the trouble is right now that the forecasts aren't really much better than county scale. I could give it to you, but it's got so many error bars, you'd want to be very careful about using it. The second one is tropical cyclones. We <coughs> developed for the insurance industry uh, many years ago a cyclone damage potential index. And um, that incorporates not just the intensity, it incorporates the size and the translation speed. And it turns out when you do that, there are a number of occasions where intensity is not actually important. We focus way too much on it. If you think of an example, if you say, oh yeah, okay, yeah, what about Hurricane Ike coming into the, um, to the uh, western uh, Gulf of Mexico region? It was a category two and it caused more damage than most other hurricanes that come into that region, simply because it was big and slow moving. So this is just simply a little snapshot of, of, of some of the worst cyclones in, um, in the 2005 season. And if you read the newspapers, they tell you what a disaster it was for the US. Well, you look at this particular map here, and suddenly you realize that uh, even though it never made the US press, it was the largely indigenous communities in the Yucatan Peninsula that took the hiding, and they took a very big hiding. I mean, they lost, completely lost crops and things like that. There was just nothing left. We can click on a particular storm and you can look at, in this case, the infamous Katrina. And uh, that's, uh, again, it's, it, it's really not showing up well here, but that's the, um, that's the land, that's over in New Orleans just there. And Katrina was a disaster for New Orleans. 
There's no doubt about that. But look at what it would have been if, it was, if this bit out here had come across there. And when you actually look at these and you start to look at some famous cases like New Orleans, like Katrina, I'm sorry, you realise Katrina was not a natural disaster. Katrina was a man-made disaster by the actions we'd taken beforehand that we couldn't survive a cyclone which is considered to be on the low level of damage potential for cyclones that eventually will hit this region. And I know, I know the folks down in the, um, down in the bayou uh, really appreciate uh, this sort of, a, of an issue. We can do a whole range of things. I'll leave them up there without any further discussion. We can do a, sea, a forecast out to seven days. We can do seasonal. We can do decadal. And we're currently running for the entire globe a set of observed landfalling and synthetic landfalling storms. So you can actually use these for, plan, for, for planning. The second one is uh, a quick look at uh, rainfall. And, and I've used cyclones in this camper. We've got a special version of WARF, which uh, now can actually be, we can put a, any old cyclone in it and steer it around. And I just want to show you, this is a control situation that we did for Australia in this case, where the white through here is the heavy rainfall, accumulated rainfall as this, as this control cyclone came ashore. And then what happens when you actually change various parameters? Well, I'm just going to show you if you add 2 degrees C to the sea surface temperature, you notice this area down here, and look at that, there was no rainfall there. Now look what's happened. The flood rainfalls extended down the coast. It also got stronger in the cyclone, but now it's a very large extent down the coast. And that's what I mean about these compounding things. You might expect that this is going to go up, but you don't expect that this is going to go up. These are these sort of compounding effects that kick in. And if I show you the, um, sorry, let me just go back. We then look at all of the out, at all of the rainfall over all of the catchments in this region. I've just given three here so you can get a perspective of where we're at. The same three are at the top. And this gives you intensity changes, size changes and everything else. But I just want to focus on that's the two degree one there. And you see there's a whole, a very large slice of the coast that uh, got dumped on by heavy rain that would not have got dumped on if that cyclone had occurred 20 years ago. It turns out also that we've just had Tropical Cyclone Debbie come through almost the same location and it just happened to have almost two degrees uh, anomalous uh, sea surface temperatures and when you actually, I don't have the figure with me, but when you actually plot this up that's what happened and the damage due to the cyclone coming ashore was less than 50 percent of the damage that the cyclone did because of all this massive flooding as we go around. The last one, <coughs> coming back to the US, but I, I, might I might add all these apply everywhere on Earth. We, I'm just using examples because these are the people that paid me to do it. Um, the, uh, and, and, and that means I can then apply it everywhere else on Earth, but you've got to start somewhere. This is the hail climatology for, um, for the United States. It's pretty good, but it's also lousy. You'll notice that uh, you've got a whoops. You've got a good. Come on. You've got a good um, spread and uh, that. But see all these little lumps. You want to guess what they are? That's all the big cities. Now hail doesn't just go over the big cities. It's just that it gets observed there. Therefore, you put it into the record. And I bet you won't find too many reservations in there because that's not getting into the record. So you're not even here on the record. Well, what we can do is we can take a physical approach and we can go back to the, to the global, uh, in this case, reanalyses, and just based on the physics of what makes a tropical cyclone, that's what makes a, a, a severe hailstorm, we can fill that out. And now this is what happens and what you get. You notice it's a very different picture at one level, but let's just look at uh, this one here. It looks very different, but let's go back. It's exactly the same area, it's just we've now filled in those gaps. Are they real? You'll never know, but they're actually the best guess we can possibly make. We can then take that and go on and look at climate change. We can look at individual areas. We can come down to, you know, 100 kilometres or so. We can actually come down to a reservation scale uh, and do that. But I'll just show you as my last slide what happens if you go back and look at past climatology. Here is Time running along here, normalised frequency up here. We normalise it so you don't have to worry about differences in, in actual scale. And this line here is the observed hail climatology from the, what I showed you before. You see it's been increasing substantially. 
been a lot of argument about whether this is climate change or just because we've changed the observing system or there's just more people in vulnerable areas and things like that. Well, if we actually take that line there and, and, and just detrend it, this is the line. We then apply no, no touches at all, just apply that technique that we developed for hail uh, across the, each one of those years, and that's what you get. And it actually follows the detrended line almost perfectly. So what it's saying is there is no climate change here. This is all observing system, and indeed, if anything, climate change is dropping them off a bit. I wouldn't hang my hat on that, by the way. I'm saying it's not going up massively. And we looked into this one here, and that was purely and simply because the National Weather Service changed their definition of hail that, that year. It had nothing to do with anything else. So that's the problems that you have, and these are just some of the tools that we can apply. Again, I really do want to absolutely say, with everything I can say, we really hope that you will actually come and contribute to this, or you'll come and tell us what you need, because then we can quite probably find other contributors. If you come and contribute a little bit and say, here's what I need to finish it, that's even better, because then we've got something to work off. And please think that through, and uh, thanks again to Heather for the time. We probably can make time for a, a quick question or two if there are any burning questions right now. Um, the answer is yes and no. We're, we're not, we, are, we will not be getting involved in what normally is thought of as citizen science simply because we've only got a small number of people and there's only so many. So we, we say, give me the data or tell me how I can get it and we'll put it into this system. But we have done it in the context of some industries we are actually getting their data that haven't been publicly available before. And so it's, it's partly yes but partly no. Thank you. Uh, the Cocoa Ross will give you, you can order hail observing pads. So you can be part of, uh, or Cocoa Ross does include hail in it. So you could check that out. And I think they're relatively yeah. inexpensive. They're just little foam plates you put out. And as hail hits it, you can measure that little kind of permanent record of the hail. So just to note that. The microphone, I just wanted to know if we could get, can we get a copy of your slides. Oh yes, absolutely. And not only can you have everyone have a copy, and if you want to use them, just go ahead and use them. That's not a problem. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, wonderful. And Greg is around. Um, you can also reach him afterwards if you have thoughts. Feel free to email me, and I can put you in touch as well. Um, I had about 10 exciting ideas for a new research project as he was talking, so hopefully I'll chat to some of you all as well. I would love to have Jean come up, <laughs> if you're ready. Um, Jean will, facilitate, will moderate the next um, session of presenters. Jean is from the NOAA Office of Coastal Management, Pacific Islands, and was one of our hosts for our gathering last year in Hawaii. So now we're putting her to work again. <laughs> Aloha, good morning. Um, <clears throat> as Heather said, I'm Jean Tanimoto. I am from Waimea on the island of Hawaii, uh, born and raised and now living on Oahu by way of many places, including Denver, uh, for a couple of years, working for NOAA's Office for Coastal Management. And if I could have my panel come up, um, we'll introduce them. Yeah, <laughs> we put the ramp there for a reason, so now you got to use it.
Uh, so as, as uh, folks have mentioned this morning, I think yesterday was a great day. Um, so much information. I think by the end of the day, we were pretty full in our heads. And so hope everyone got some good sleep. Um, this morning, we'd like to start off with a panel on building collaboration for research and action. Um, and I'd like to um, ask Carolyn Brinkworth, who is here at NCAR, uh, to be our first presenter. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so I was all due to have a super flashy presentation and then um, I managed to lose my laptop yesterday. <laughs> if, if anybody has seen a black rucksack, a black and olive green rucksack with my laptop in it, with my name on it, I would greatly appreciate your help in not having to explain to my boss why I lost it. So <laughs> um, anyway, so um, I am speaking from my notes and I will try to make this as entertaining as possible. Uh, my name is Carolyn Brinkworth and I am UCAR's Chief Diversity Officer. Um, for every single one of you who is looking at me with some side eye right now with deep skepticism about why a white woman is leading diversity efforts at a predominantly white organization, I hear you. <laughs> um, I fully hear you. I, I understand your skepticism. And, that, and I want to acknowledge that there are things that I will never truly appreciate as a white woman and I will never truly get right here as a white woman. Um, I want you to know that I know that. I want you to know that I will listen and learn. Um, and I'm bound to get it wrong at some point. And what I want to say to you all is if you choose to call me out on that and if you choose to um, hold me accountable, I'm not saying you have to, but if you, if you do, then that will absolutely be received with gratitude and as the gift that it is. So I want to thank you um, in advance to everybody who chooses to do that and set me right. In the meantime, I'd like to really extend my thanks um, to you all for allowing me to be here. Um, I very much wanted to be at Rising Voices last year. Uh, unfortunately, my wife got very sick last year, and so I stayed home to take care of her. Um, so this is my first Rising Voices. It's extremely exciting. Um, I want to thank every single one of you for sharing your thoughts, for sharing your ideas, um, and for sharing your stories. Um, I have learned more in the last two days than I can even begin to tell you. And I think this is the thing about diversity work every time, is the more you learn, the more you realize you have to learn. Um, and, and I have realized how little I knew, how little I still know, and how much I still have to learn um, about the issues that all of you are facing. Um, so I very much hope that we can work in community to um, keep telling stories and to keep figuring all this out. So I'd like to take a few minutes to um, talk about the direction of UCAR and NCAR um, and then talk to you about a specific project that we have going in collaboration with many of people in this room and I really hope that we can extend those collaborations even further. Um, what you probably don't know is that uh, back about six months ago we hired a new president here at UCAR. His name is Tony Busalaki. And he came in with a, a very different vision for how UCAR and NCAR should be moving forward. Um, partly he has established my new office, which is the Office for Diversity and Inclusion. And we hired Kristen Luna Raponte. You want to stand up for a second, Kristen? Say hi to everyone. And Kristen is um, yeah, absolutely a round of applause for Kristen. <laughs> Kristen is UCAR's new Equity and Inclusion Program Specialist um, and doing a wonderful job. She's been here since Halloween. And Tony has um, asked our office, me and, I say our office, me and Kristen, um, to come up with um, a, a, a strategic plan for diversity and inclusion here at UCAR and NCAR. And the strategic plan is focusing you know, both on diversity, on inclusion, and on integration. So the integration of many different ways of knowing and many different ways of seeing the world into the work that we do. Um, that's going to take about 18 months, and we have many, many different things that we're doing. Kristen and I are um, rather frantically overloaded right now with the things that we're trying to put into action. Um, but one of these things is training for our scientists and encouraging our scientists to engage in conversations about colonialism, about social justice, about the ethics of Western science and how we do science, um, and how we think about decentering the Western culture in the science that we do. And so I want to assure you that these are all conversations that we are starting, um, we are having, and will be part of the conversations that we have moving forward. Tony also has this um, feeling about um, how we should be uh, providing science to the community. And so his mantra is very much, NCAR and UCAR should be doing science in service to society. And I think that's great. I think that's exactly what science should be. I want to look at this through a slightly different lens, though, um, especially for this audience, and think about Western science in service to communities. And I think that that really gets more at the heart of what it is that we're trying to do. Um, 
And so for the past two days, I've been listening to the stories that you've all been telling um, and listening out for ways that UCAR and NCAR really can bring Western science in service to communities. So um, I would love to have more conversations about what I've heard, um, but here's a few things that I've heard over the past few days. Um, Western climate science doesn't really produce enough tangible, actionable info to be necessarily useful to the communities who need that information. That's the first thing I've heard. The second thing I've heard is that Western science is often so filled with jargon or in formats that uh, make sharing uh, knowledge um, either difficult or impossible. Second thing I've heard. Um, I've heard that Western science uh, often dismisses the legitimacy of indigenous science. And I've heard that there are needs for pathways for native students to get training in Western science that complement their indigenous science knowledge rather than trying to replace it. So this is what I've heard over the past few days. I would love to hear more input if people want to come talk to me about other things that I've missed. But I think that this is a way in which UCAR and NCAR really can be of service to your communities. Um, and I want to talk about a specific project that we have going on, which is in, say, in collaboration with many folks in this room. Um, and it's through the NSF Includes call. Um, so for those of you who don't know what Includes is, uh, it's, it, this is what it is. It's inclusion across the nation of communities of learners of underrepresented discoverers in engineering and science. And I take my hat off to whoever spent way too long on that acronym. It's very impressive. <laughs> Um, but this is a proposal that we wrote last year, and it's a, it's a collaboration between um, NCAR and UCAR, um, between Dan Wildcat, uh, Carl Wyatt, Heather Lazarus, uh, who's uh, representing Rising Voices, um, uh, Kevin Bonine, who is from Biosphere 2, <coughs> Beck Batchelor, who I know had to leave for something else, but um, she uh, is the director right now of the uh, SOARS program, which is an internship program um, specifically designed to uh, work with um, diverse students. Uh, and Kristen Wegner. Um, is Kristen in the room? We don't have Kristen yet. Um, so Kristen Wegner um, is working with GLOBE um, and represents GLOBE, uh, which is a citizen science and um, a project that helps to get science into schools, into K through 12 schools. And we came together to uh, write this proposal because we're interested in co-developing research partnerships between indigenous communities and Western science organizations where NCAR and Biosphere 2 can bring Western science to complement and be in service to the needs of our indigenous partners. So that's what we're trying to do. And we would love to have conversations with anybody in this room who sees ways in which we can help and be of service to you um, and your communities, because we really want to develop these partnerships and to take the idea of rising voices and a little, a little, little further, kind of extend a little further. Um, so that this, these research projects are going to act as the hub for the proposals, that, 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 for the work that we are doing. Um, and in addition to that, we're looking at bringing students in through the SOURCE program, so bringing native students in, um, to take part in either these research projects, if this is what they're interested in, or a different research project, if they're really not interested in these projects, <coughs> to give them the training in the Western science that can then help them to um, complement their indigenous uh, knowledge. Um, we are working with Biosphere 2, and Biosphere 2 are going to be working um, on these research projects as well. So NCAR and Biosphere 2 have a number of synergies that we've got going on, and we would love them to work, say, with, with, with partners on this. Um, we, like I said, have SOARS bringing the students in, and then Kristen would love to work with K-12 through schools um, within your communities to um, be doing hands-on science with kids, um, hopefully to be collecting data to feed into the research projects that we're doing. As part of this, I want to emphasize that our mentors are getting training, so we're not randomly putting a whole bunch of white scientists and expecting them to do the right thing. Um, as part of that, Kyle White ran an amazing uh, uh, one-day workshop for us on Wednesday, where I, my mind was blown. I learned so much. Um, and uh, this is part of the ongoing training that we're going to be giving our science mentors. So we have, uh, like I said, this one-day workshop that really introduces folks to the political and cultural and, uh, issues and the protocols that uh, we need to be following. Um, and then we have uh, Dan Wildcat and Kyle who are both uh, acting as mentors for our scientists who are making sure that we don't put our foot in it and we, we, we get things right as we uh, continue our interactions. 
So that's includes. If anybody would like to come and talk to me about includes, about maybe ways in which NCAR and Biosphere 2 can work with you and can help you and can be in service to you, we would love to have those conversations. Like I said, we are looking to create these collaborations uh, between our scientists, Biospheres 2 scientists, and your communities, and we would, like I say, love to explore that more. So that's all I have, and I'm going to hand back over to our next panelist. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, that was great. Um, for those of you who did not join us on Wednesday, that was a really an amazing workshop. Um, I did have to go home and sit on the couch for a couple of hours afterwards just to let it all sink in a little bit. Um, I'd like to ask Melissa Watkins to come up next. Melissa is from Seattle, and she is at the University of Washington. And oh, excuse me. Um, I think we're going to do questions at the end. So if you have questions for our panels, we'll do them after all of them have spoken. Good morning. How are you? Great. My name is Melissa Watkinson. Um, I, uh, as, as uh, Jean said, from Seattle, Washington. Uh, this is my second Rising Voices. I was here two years ago um, in this very room where I was just finishing up my graduate degree. And I had, in the process of um, completing my master's in policy studies, worked with the Quinault Indian Nation, and I pre presented that research here two years ago. Um, something that else that happened that day was where it was learning about what I was going to be doing next. I had applied for a fellowship, which is a marine policy fellowship, and I got a notification that I would be working at the Nature Conservancy. So it's the Nature Conservancy. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Um, and so, to come full circle from, from that two years ago, uh, having completed my one-year fellowship with the Nature Conservancy back in September, um, I had been asked to be part of this panel on building collaborations, and I think Julie really wanted me to focus on some of the things that I learned uh, and, and did and contributed to while I was at the Nature Conservancy. Um, and on the way here, on the plane, I was wearing this sweatshirt, and the woman sitting next to me, she, was wearing, she had pulled out the Delta Sky magazine, and on the cover of that magazine was the CEO of the Nature Conservancy. So it really felt like it had come full circle. Uh, and I read some of what he had been saying in the magazine, and it was talking about how it's a science-based organization, uh, and they work with a lot of indigenous populations around the world. And then they went on to say about how business solutions were, were leading in conservation as, as privatization was the best way to do conservation um, in modern days. But I feel like I've learned a lot in the process of working with the Nature Conservancy that might not have been successful, um, especially as a young Native woman working in a predominantly white organization that is based on colonization processes um, taking, purchasing land, um, and, sa and saving it. There are some, some potentially shared goals and values in that process um, in, of conservation, but it's, but it's based on, the, you can see a lot of the board representatives are really um, people who have historically just taken land that was previously stolen from American Indians. So this obviously, walking into this place, for me at least, was troubling. Um, I had Mike Chang, who was working there with me. He's, he was a fellow, and he's here today. And I have a lot to thank for, to him for being a soundboard in that process and learning you know, how to navigate um, this system. Um, in the process of working at the Nature Conservancy, I, I was asked to do some things that were related to working on the coast of Washington State. Um, TNC is broken up by chapters, so each state has its own chapter. Uh, and so, uh, as a Marine Policy Fellow, we were working on the shoreline master planning and mass, uh, marine spatial planning, some of these things that you have on the coast, coastal areas. And um, I'm a very spatial person. I did my, my, my 
my, uh, my capstone in, in grad school using GIS and spatial analysis. And so first thing I do is kind of see what are, where are the communities there along the coast, some of which I knew really well, some of which I, I didn't know about before, and brought it to my boss. And, and there was, um, it, in the Pacific County, which is where we were working at, at the time, um, Shoalwater Bay Tribe, who was have has is federally recognized. They're a non-trading tribe in the state of Washington, um, but they weren't a part of the conversations or at the table for the shoreline master planning. But they have a lot of um, tide lands, and uh, in the and their inclusion of that community should be seen as very valuable for the Nature Conservancy. So I asked, why is this not the case? And and they said, well, you know, we they just maybe maybe they're they're not a treaty tribe or we tried to reach out to them and they didn't want to participate. Um, and I don't know what that meant. I don't know what that outreach was. But to me, it just seemed like having, not having them at the table was an issue. Um, but that was just an example that kind of led to identifying some other things that were wrong with what they were doing. Um, I have to say, I'm not trying to bash the Nature Conservancy right now. I'm trying to talk mostly about my own experiences and what I've seen. They do some great work. Um, but, but, and, I, and I think the fact that they actually provided me an opportunity to address it and I felt confident in doing that maybe shows some of that, um, um, some, of the, some of the great things that they might be doing within um, communities and as an organization. Um, so so I, in, in re response to what I had seen, I asked if I could do some kind of training within our team, and that was just, let's talk about what the treaties are in the area. Let's talk about the tribes in the area that we're working with, and let's do a little bit of homework and trying to figure out uh, what their concerns are um, and what their history and context is and, and if there are other things that we should be looking into consideration. Uh, and that led to then the the uh, director of the Washington State Nature Conservancy asking me to do a training for the entire um, staff within the Washington chapter, about 70 people, uh, four of which identify with a different race and ethnicity other than white. Um, so I was, said, sure, that's a, that sounds like something I might be able to do. Thanks to many of the people that are in the room, um, and I especially have to thank Kyle White for sharing knowledge. Um, he was available to me to talk through what that might mean to be able to do that training, what are some key points that I needed to make sure that we discussed, uh, and what are, what are some uh, lenses that um, I could be going into that work with and other, other resources in the process. Um, so, so this is a picture of after the, that training happened. Mike, uh, Mike Stevens on the right is uh, the doctor, and TJ Green from the Macaw Tribe uh, in Washington State, who is a member of the board of the Nature Conservancy in Washington. Um, we, were, we were kind of the co-organizers of, of the training, which, um, which meant that I was in touch with TJ a lot more and um, working with some of the staff at the Nature Conservancy to really put together uh, one training that, that would, I think, really utilize some of the things that I learned would be important, but also the, um, how to put it in a lens where the predominantly white community and at the Nature Conservancy can really, can really learn and understand what was happening. So I'm briefly gonna go over some of the content of what was done in that training, mostly because that might be useful for you. Um, but I'm gonna end with the lessons learned and some of the actions that were taken. Um, and I'm hoping that environmental NGOs who are here, um, and, that, and that can all, this knowledge can also apply for academics and um, other organ organizations about what it means for, for a young Native person to be working within an organization that um, doesn't really reflect their values as much. Um, and, then, and then also to young, other young Native people who might know, need to know that they're not alone, but also what are some, some things that you can do to, to navigate that situation. Some of the, the questions that we were, I was kind of thinking about at, answering for uh, what the Nature Conservancy might have wanted to know is what are, what, how do uh, environmental NGOs effectively collaborate with tribes in ways that respect tribal sovereignty and is mutually beneficial? 
Um, and then on the other side of that, perhaps um, some tribes might be asking, how do tribes effectively collaborate with environmental NGOs in ways to protect tribal sovereignty and is mutually beneficial? This is a Washington State map from the Department of Ecology of the Ceded Lands. This is um, an introduction to how the, this training went, went on. Well, of course, we started with an opening ceremony um, and icebreaker introductions, which is always important to do. Um, thinking about the place that you're in, uh, the people who are there, um, the, being part of the community, making it a safe space. Uh, but then going into just some context about the, the place that we're in uh, generally within Washington State. This is a brief outline of what the training itself is like. Um, we had the historical and cultural context presentation, mostly of Washington State, um, but also including some of the uh, timelines of historic policies within the United States as well. And we also work uh, as, or as the Nature Conservancy in Washington also collaborates a lot with uh, uh, TNC Canada, and they do a lot of work along the Emerald Edge, which reaches into the BC. So we had some, we had uh, BC First Nations um, gentlemen come present a little bit about that context as well, so we can have that. Uh, and then TJ Green pre presented some information or an example of stewardship uh, within his own community. And then we had a panel that, that was uh, made up of different staff um, and, and TJ and the B and BC First Nations. Uh, we can have kind of a variety of different ideas of lessons learned in that process. It's important too, I think, to look at how uh, lands, because, because TNC is essentially a land-based conservation organization, and how does that relate to uh, spatially within tribal areas, uh, not only the reservations, but in ceded lands and, and UNAs as well. Uh, and then this is uh, little pictures of a larger timeline that was included and provided to all the staff. Um, but it, it was brought out recognizing that there's, of course, a lot of more history that happened before 1825, but what are some of the key points that happened since colonization that affects um, tribal culture, tribal ways of doing and knowing, um, and then in consideration for what the Nature Conservancy staff might be thinking, well, how, does, how do those events line up with events that they might be more familiar with, such as the World War? And in the process, uh, also explaining that there are multiple designations by the federal government um, that tribes might be fitting into. We have federally recognized tribes. We have tribes that, are, that have treaties. We have tribes who are not federally recognized. Um, and then we can have a combination of any of those. And I think there's actually examples of each of that within uh, Washington state. And then providing some principles of engagement but, that were provided and, and um, compiled by many of the people who are in this room. And this isn't it because I actually decided I would change my presentation last minute last night. So um, I'm going to go into the lessons learned, and I have three, three key points. Uh, the first one is Native people have their own independent sovereignty. And the action might be uh, for young people or, or early career people to push outside that box. They might think that the organization that is might think that they're taking a, a diversity box by having you work within the organization and asking you to participate in tribal specific projects, but make your experience worth more than being part of that box. Two, being native does not give you the power to speak on behalf of all natives. And I should say these are my experiences, right? <laughs> Even if that's what the organization expects you to do. <laughs> the action here, teach them that each tribe and native person is different. And the third one is, if you're going to call out something that's inappropriate uh, or disrespectful in their approach to work, how they work with tribes, be prepared to lead actions that address it. And the action there is show them that collaboration uh, is not an obligation. Um, and as Dan would say, that I've learned from him is that it's actually a responsibility 
we have many responsibilities. Um, so those are the three key points. And, I, and I, to walk away, we have collaboration you know, it certainly takes many different forms. And it doesn't always lead to successful activities. I, at the end of my fellowship, you know, I don't know what that training or what that new knowledge will be, uh, will, will do for that organization or for the people that are within the organization. Um, but it doesn't mean that if it's not successful that it's over. We, ha we still have a lot of work to do. Um, and I think the last point for sh the last point is that to be, in my perspective, truly effective in collaboration, um, particularly in this case for an ENGO to be working with tribal nations is to put forth the funding and personal capacity um, to strengthen that relationship. Thanks. Thank you, Melissa, for sharing your experiences that I think a lot of us in the room probably have some experience with as well. Um, our office um, actually has a relationship with the Nature Conservancy Hawaii chapter, and we work closely with the Marine Fellows, and I think that there are a few who would be really interested <laughs> in the training that you did for your group and um, would probably like to talk. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, Next, I would like to bring up Roberto Borrero. He is uh, from Puerto Rico, but living in New York now. Um, and Roberto? All right. Let's uh, have another round of applause for our previous presenters. They're great. I know I'm taking notes and uh, learning some things and uh, really appreciating uh, the threads that I, that I see running in this dialogue so far. So I'm real happy to uh, be a part of this panel. And um, I'll just begin by saying, Taimautia, Ituno Kena, Atiaono. And um, besides my uh, Taino sister in the audience, I don't know if anybody can uh, translate that. But if you can, don't worry. Columbus didn't understand that stuff 500 years ago. We've been trying to work things out ever since. But um, anyway, my name is, uh, I just wanted to say good morning to my brothers and sisters. And uh, in, in my ways of knowing, that's you know, how we see each other you know, as human beings, as, as relations. And I find this. Uh, this way of, of, of looking at things is, is really common among many indigenous peoples, nations, and communities around the world. So uh, when we were talking about collaboration, I, I think I just wanted to follow up a little bit on uh, some of the things that were brought up yesterday in the international sense. I, I mean, I know that um, we're normally, from what I've heard, the, the, this conference is really focused on things happening in the US, but this year they wanted to expand it a little bit to try to bring in and connect uh, global issues. And uh, regardless of you know some folks who are maybe uh, think they're steering the canoe at this point and that the US is not part of the rest of the world, but um, you know it actually is. And uh, so what I wanted to talk about this morning was uh, this agenda that the United Nations has. It's like one of the main focuses right now of United Nations development work, which is called the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, basically, Sustainable Development Goals are a new set of uh, universal targets, indicators that uh, UN member states, and when we say states, we're talking about countries, right? We're not saying like New Jersey or, or Colorado. We're talking about uh, different countries that uh, they'll be expected to use as a, of a frame to frame their agendas and political policies over the next 15 years. So they're calling this, uh, you also hear about sustainable development goals also being called the uh, post-2030 agenda. So that links to the outcome document uh, that came out of this process, which was called Transforming Our World. And it's really interesting because it's talking about development. So uh, ultimately, we're really talking about the last of the resources left on the planet, right? And how people are going to be engaging them, governments, uh, et cetera. And uh, just so that uh, you can just see 
The SDGs are a set of uh, 17 global goals. As I said, that'll, that'll be uh, targeted through 2030. They're backed up by 169 targets. Uh, they've been negotiated over two years, and they've been agreed to by nearly all the world's nations on uh, September 25th. And I just want to uh, point out, I don't know if you could really see this clearly, but probably for this group, uh, what's interesting is um, number 13, climate action, uh, 17, goal 17, partnerships for the goals, uh, et cetera. But I, I mean, I think that we could see that at least in the indigenous peoples uh, context, uh, we can relate to most all the goals. And so that's why it's important for indigenous peoples uh, to be part of this process. So what's new? Uh, some of you might have heard of, of a different uh, global agenda called the Millennium Development Goals. And uh, so the SDGs are like the follow-up. They were supposed to take on uh, the gaps, what, 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 wasn't, uh, what, what the UN didn't really touch upon. And really throughout that process of the MDGs, indigenous peoples uh, really came out and said, you know, we were invisible in this process. And so there was a really strong desire by indigenous peoples from around the world uh, to engage in this process uh, because ultimately this is supposed to be a universal agenda. Again, we're talking about uh, a development agenda for the entire planet. Again, so that should concern everybody, right? We're talking about the resources, how we interact with lands, the, the ocean, et cetera, uh, for the whole planet. So uh, these goals apply to every nation and every sector, and that includes cities, businesses, schools, organizations, again, highlighting that these goals are universal. Also that these goals are interconnected. And uh, what was interesting for me uh, participating in this process was I heard a lot of terminology that I think really indigenous peoples had impacted the UN in some way. They were talking about future generations, right? And their responsibilities uh, to the planet, right? And so I said, you know, this is very interesting in that it kind of coincides with all the indigenous people's activism at the international level over all these years and that we have made an impact even on their dialogue. Now, I'm not talking about implementation, right? That's a whole nother story, but at least the dialogue is there and we were, we're having this conversation. So the aim of these uh, goals is not to just achieve one, Again, they're interconnected, and uh, the, from the UN perspective, we have to achieve them all really to make the transformation that they want to see. So they're looking at this as a transformational agenda. And again, you know, I, when I hear these things, I always get a little nervous, and which is why I feel that as indigenous peoples and anybody of, of good conscience, right, we should be really aware of these processes, really see what's being said, and really take the opportunities to participate wherever we can. Because if you don't go, then oh, you know, we might hear things, as, as uh, you mentioned in your uh, presentation, where, oh, these folks didn't really want to participate, so let's just go ahead and do this stuff. And that's when you get into fast tracking of development. And we see on the ground that fast tracking always leads to human rights violations, right? And particularly against uh, indigenous peoples. So how we participate in this process and how the collaborations form. Uh, just to, to show you once again, the, uh, the Secretary General, uh, this is how they, they frame the, the SDGs. They talk about people, and you can see ending poverty and hunger. That's kind of uh, some of the leftover from the Millennium Goals process. Uh, pr planet, protecting natural resources, and climate for future generation. Again, putting climate change at the head of the agenda. A prosperity, a partnership, and also peace. Right, re relating to and, and you know how poignant after what uh, Suzanne shared with us this morning about uh, the bombing and with the, the direction we see ourselves going in. So peace is really a part of this agenda and it's really a part of sustainability and I think that indigenous peoples understand that. Right? And this is why treaties are made, this is why uh, connections are made in between communities, why some of our languages are extended so, so far across regions. And right? I know my own Taino language, we have uh, relationships from the Caribbean islands all the way down into South America because of that, that kind of ideal, you know, that ultimately that peaceful ideal. And uh, so within that process, the participatory uh, process, they identified different sectors. And you can see these are called nine major groups. And one is indigenous peoples. And interestingly enough, 
Another one is a scientific and technological community. So there's obviously there's uh, room for collaboration, participation, and also uh, holding people accountable in this. And, and we saw this throughout the process. We would listen to other uh, sectors making presentations because everybody was vying for their, uh, we can say constituency, I guess for lack of a better word, uh, for the views and what, what people wanted to see in these goals. And as uh, I was working with uh, other indigenous peoples in that, trying to get our views from the global perspective into this document, was not easy as, as you, know, you can imagine any other UN process is. So uh, we saw this in Paris, we see this in this, where we really had to struggle to remind the states that they have responsibilities and obligations to indigenous peoples that are uh, really defined in international law. And uh, they, they understand that, even the US, even though they like to deny that and they, they, they don't like to feel that their uh, international law is often applicable to them because the national law or their national policy uh, kind of trumps that. But, uh, but uh, <laughs> I was waiting to see who catched that one. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, really, they do have it. And even the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples highlights that. So in other words, uh, as you heard just mentioned, we have this reality in the United States to take it, for example, you have federally recognized tribes, you also have state recognized tribes, and then you have another uh, number of indigenous peoples, communities that are not recognized uh, at either level. So, um, but if you really look at the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, really that doesn't matter. It's really the self-determination of the communities, right? That says, so even if the US does not want to recognize my community, for example, you know, we can still affirm and uh, move towards our own self-determination because we have that right. It's an, inherent, it's an inherent right. It's not a right. Remember, these rights are not something that is given to us. It's things that we're born with. Right? And so that's what we have to constantly remind people of, even in these processes. So one of the ways that we do this is by participating uh, within the Indigenous Peoples Major Group, and other Indigenous Peoples are always welcome to be a part of that. We have a listserv. We try to send out a lot of information, work on uh, joint interventions to remind people and, and to really hold the agenda accountable. Right, from an indigenous perspective. And, and again, try to work with some of these other sectors to see where there are collaborations or partnerships, because partnerships is a big, is a big uh, focus on this. So, um, let me see here. Okay, so our advocacy uh, within this agenda resulted in six direct references to indigenous peoples within the final outcome document. And, uh, you know, it was, it's important again because, as we thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that and all those who worked on this and, and some of my uh, dear sister colleagues here, my comrades in arms, you know, sisters in the struggle and others, you know, are part of this uh, process at various levels and probably some of you that I don't even know uh, pushing for things uh, where on the ground or wherever you are. But um, these references come in the final outcome document, which is uh, transforming our world. It's, it's the uh, 2030 agenda. So, so I would uh, you know, recommend that people get uh, familiar with that document, really see, and follow up on this. But goal two is uh, specifically uh, has a target that uh, mentions indigenous peoples, and it's related to agricultural output, uh, indigenous small scale farmers, and goal four is on equal access to education for indigenous children. So these are things that we have to also you know, be wary of. We, as indigenous peoples, we have seen already the result of education, right? But you know, whose education, where is that coming from? Do we have any part in that? You know, do we have any control? So again, you have to be cautious on, on what these, and follow up with the countries. And again, having these six references are important because this is the opportunity for people once uh, these documents are done, to go back to their home countries and really hold the governments accountable at some level, right? Because the governments are supposed to be having national action plans, even this government, on the SDGs, and they're supposed to have national committees formed, and they, they also uh, have reporting obligations to the agenda that they do every year in uh, July under what they call the high-level a political forum for the SDGs and post-2030 agenda. So this is where uh, governments will kind of report on how they're trying to implement the SDGs, what are some of the gaps, 
uh, maybe highlight some of the partnerships, et cetera. So uh, the framework also calls on indigenous peoples to actively engage in implementing. So it's also an opportunity for us to highlight within these meetings to say, well, this is what's working for us. This is what we're doing as a community to implement a sustainable development agenda from our perspective, or to call out governments and say, well, wait a minute, you know, you're presenting a national review where was the mention of indigenous peoples here? How did you outreach to our communities? And then this way, you know, some kind of dialogue hopefully will ensue that will be beneficial to the communities and, and peoples involved. Uh, there's also a global uh, list of indicators that's being developed. A number of them uh, specifically reference indigenous peoples. This wasn't the case when they first started. And we have to remind them again, hey, you know, we need that specific indigenous peoples reference or else we'll be lost in, in the data collection and we won't be there. Indigenous peoples, as engaging in the UN over the years, we've said, you know, it's hard to really develop these uh, policies if there's no disaggregated data. Right, because we're often overlooked or maybe we're not recognized as indigenous peoples and so they, they overlook this and it's really hard to, to impact policy in a way if we don't have that, that material to help us do that. So um, this was another important a aspect of this, uh, of our advocacy there. And it had made a change and particularly talking about land tenure. And this is important for indigenous peoples outside uh, of the US, right, who have to engage in, not everybody has treaties uh, with governments or had to engage in, in that process. So for indigenous peoples around the world, this idea of land tenure, uh, co-management, et cetera, is important to bring up. It brings up the rights uh, for other indigenous peoples, and especially in, in Asia, where they, according to the UN, is probably the majority of the world's indigenous peoples living in Asia. I don't know how they figure all this stuff out, but this is the, the data that they're presenting to us. But, um, okay, so this is uh, about 2015, they had an expert group meeting uh, with the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Some of you may have heard of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. It's another mechanism that was developed. Uh, to raise the visibility of indigenous peoples within the UN system. It was one of the first after a long, uh, after a long, long process of, of trying, to, uh, trying to get something like this in the UN. Uh, in, originally it was envisioned as something else, as a place where we can really uh, bring our, our issues to and, and have some concrete action, right? Some kind of mechanism. But it's morphed into this, uh, what we have today. And it's still uh, valid because it, it gives the opportunity for indigenous peoples to come present, to connect with other uh, like-minded communities and, and really build partnerships, collaborations, uh, make connections with uh, funding agencies or UN programs that might help them uh, do things that they wanna do in their communities to, again, benefit their own people. So this is a really important part of that. But. Uh, uh, the Permanent Forum organized an expert uh, group meeting on the SDGs uh, in 2015. And these are some of the recommendations and probably might be interesting uh, for folks in this room. One is that uh, the indicators uh, reflect indigenous people's situations, including uh, collective land indicators and data disaggregation should be included in the global and national monitoring frameworks for the sustainable development goals. Uh, indigenous peoples as one of the major groups should be supported in reporting on their contribution uh, to sustainable development goals. Member states should uh, facilitate participation in national level, again, that responsibility. Uh, partnerships should be built between indigenous peoples and other relevant stakeholders. That means in between the other major groups, and that's kind of what we're talking about here, collaboration and action, and which is really the SDGs are about that, uh, we hope, right? Uh, action on, on a positive level. And also that national data collection and sharing of desegregated data should be improved to highlight the progress made on indigenous people's priorities. So what are those? And obviously you have to talk to communities to understand what the priorities are. So we, again, which is why it's so important for us to be a part of the process so that we can share what those priorities are. And I think that indigenous peoples have been doing a really good job on this. And so here where I wanna end uh, with this presentation, and thank you for your patience so far, um, is, a few years ago, I was asked to do a report for UNESCO on emerging trends in, with ICTs, that's information and communication technologies. And uh, I was kind of assessing what was out there, what indigenous peoples were using, and uh, hopefully making some recommendations through another uh, UN process called the uh, World Summit 
on the, the information society. And so that's probably very interesting to some uh, scientists and, and uh, other folks who work with the various forms of technology. But in that, uh, in that report that I generated, I, I presented a, a little model for folks uh, that might be helpful for people who wanted to engage in projects or engage with indigenous peoples directly. And this way that when they assess strategies, projects, programs, or policies, uh, maybe they could look at them in, in this way. And what we saw in the past was that um, there was many, uh, what I called A, or pro-indigenous uh, engagement in, in the past, meaning that folks did things for indigenous peoples. Right? There was not really a lot of collaboration. There was not really, it was like, we're going to help these people because they're vulnerable, they're marginalized, and gosh, they really need help. So we're going to do this for them. Right? The second is uh, a para-indigenous or with indigenous peoples. That means in tandem, right? so that you're working, you have a, 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 some kind of a, a engagement or, or contract or, or collaboration, um, MOU, whatever you want to say, and that you're working in tandem and that you understand what each other's responsibilities are to these projects. And the last one was uh, per-indigenous. These are programs that are led by indigenous peoples right? with the support of allies and, and et cetera. So uh, again, uh, from what we saw and what was consistent with the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and, and, and what I heard uh, participating with Indigenous Peoples over the years in the United Nations system was that we really want to see per-Indigenous initiatives, right? Or, and if we can't, really the, the para-Indigenous in issues. These are the ones. We, have, we need to move away from the pro Indigenous, right? And so this is just something to keep in mind as you engage in your programs. And uh, you know, I'm always happy to send a copy of that report to anybody who's interested in seeing that uh, report and those, uh, those recommendations, which might be relevant for here or for other things. So with that, I want to say hahom, waitiao, ono. Thank you, relatives, for the time. I very much appreciate it and appreciate hearing the rest of the panel. Thank you for that. Um, I think uh, yesterday what I heard from several people, uh, I, heard, he does. I heard from several people yesterday that they, who had come to Rising Voices in the past, that they had really appreciated the international perspectives that was here this time. Um, and so thank you for sharing that with us. Um, thank you also for reminding us that if you are not at the table, you may be on the menu. <laughs> so, uh, okay, our final presenter um, is one that I think a lot of us know. Uh, Kalani Siza is also uh, from the Big Island of Hawaii, Hawaii Island, uh, originally from Maui by way of many stops in between. <laughs> um, so, Kalani. What happened to the law of that? <laughs> Or family. So, housekeeping. I got to do some housekeeping. Um, um, first one is thank you, brother. I couldn't agree with you more. This is probably the best panel I've ever been on. You know, because uh, there's some parody, and you know, it, it feels really balanced and, and equal and nice, both in age and representation. And, you guys know me from the first one. I hate it when we just got four men up at a table. You know, because I'm Captain Hedro. I just like to hang around with the women and hear what they're saying. So thank you for that. Thank you for that, sister. And thank you for being that brave. I myself had a similar experience with TNC, and so I, I thought that was really brave for her to just take it on straight like that. And that is worth our admiration. Especially at that age. <laughs> so, uh, and I got medicine from two people yesterday. Elizabeth, thank you, thank you, thank you. And tell you how much that meant to me. And Bill Thomas, that was the best night's sleep I've had in a long time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm pretty sure Daniel Bull and the rest all thank you too. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> you know, um, so 
these two Hawaiian guys, they're going to Alaska. You know, because that's what Hawaiians do. They go to Alaska <laughs> for vacation. You know, so uh, they go every year hunting. And so this year they get there, the pilot sets them down, lands on the water, drops them off the lakeside. And these two guys, they're friends since they were like six years old. So, you know, they like their time together. So the pilot says, I'll see you in a week. Flies off. It's a pretty good week. These guys doing some hunting and basically bullshitting around the fire. The way men do. Because that's pretty much all they're good for. <laughs> so the pilot comes back to get him. And these two guys are arguing. The pilot like rolls up to the fire. And these two guys are still arguing from the night before. And apparently they both shot really big moose. And they're arguing about who gets to take the trophy home. And then one guy's like, well, my moose is big. And uh, right, so we, I'm, I'm taking this one home. He says, no, you got to take it home last year. I'm taking mine home. And so the pilot says, well, you know, we can only take one of them. The plane's kind of a little small. They just keep on arguing. And so finally, the one guy says, you know, every year we come here and we do this. And every year we put two on the plane and fly out of here. The pilot says, OK, this is my first time with you guys. Uh, if you really want to, he says, yeah, it's what we do all the time. So they load up the plane, start taxiing down across the water, and the pilots jamming it back to two guys sitting in the back seat. Planes kind of cruising along the water, but it's not getting any lift. Pilot's getting a little nervous. So he starts to rev the engine up and pull back on that stick really hard, you know. And plane goes in, in, and it just begins to lift up, and oh, boom, back down on the water again. And it bounces. And these two guys are looking out the front window, and they can see the end of the lake coming up. You know, the trees are really getting tall fast. And the pilot just yanks back on that stick and slams the throttle, you know, and the plane begins to lift, finally begins to climb. And just as they're clearing the trees, it catches one of the sleds, and the plane spins out of control. It slams into the mountainside. And the two guys come crawling out of the wreck. What happened? What happened? Huh? I don't know, bro. I don't know. First guy says, I think we're in crash. And the second guy says, where do you think we are? And the first guy says, I think we're about 500 yards from where we crashed last year. <laughs> if we keep on doing things the same way, we can pretty much predict the outcome. I'm recommending that we innovate. I'm making a suggestion that we just exit stage left. Especially under these times. You know what I mean? Since somebody trumped the deck, we might as well turn the table over. My Uncle Masa used to say, when you're looking at the chessboard and you can see 12 moves ahead and you're going to lose the game, turn the table over. Start a new game. So this is beautiful because we get the potential right here in this room to start a new game. You know? So they're wondering, oh, what are we going to do about funding when we come to the end of this game? I don't think we're at the end. I think we're just at the beginning. I really want to thank NCAR for this wonderful start. It takes a long time to move vessel. You, know, you got to have the long view. Those of you who were raised by your grandparents in the old way, you know this. When they said seven generations, they were talking about all time. Each human being, if you are lucky, are five generations. Your, your grandparents, your parents, you, your children, and your grandchildren. So you're walking five generations. The sixth generation, A, 
as all the people that came before you, your ancestry, your DNA, all the way back to the beginning. The seventh generation, that's anybody who's yet to come. Yet to come. That's why the old people say, you got to think with seven generations. You got to think all the way forward. What decision have you made in your life that wasn't made for all time? If you're going to blow your nose right now, that's going to be something you did for all time. And I would use one of these wonderful yellow handkerchiefs. <laughs> Bob keeps hawking hearts. Thank you, Bob. So these things, the decision to come here into this room, the decision to be here in these conversations, the decision to wake up in the morning and make a difference, that matters. We need to support ourselves there. Collaboration is an interesting exercise. Most people don't collaborate. They cooperate at best. At best. Now, collaboration is really tricky. I like collaboration. This is how I was taught collaboration by my Tutugane. Oh, my grandfather. You know. When I collaborate with you, I put down all my needs and wants. They go away. I don't care about what Kalani needs anymore. That's not important. I want to know what you need. What do you need? That's what I'm going to focus on. My beautiful wife, Julie, if you don't know her, you should. She's the best thing about me. The best thing about me, you know what I mean, is her. So if you want to know me, go know her. She always gets angry at me because she says, you know, you give it away. My grandfather said, give it away, give it away, give it away. It always comes back to you. We don't know how this works, but that's how it works. Everything except your time. Your time is the most precious thing you have. You only have so many sunrises and sunsets. Nobody knows how many you got. Not even you. So, be careful who you spend your time with. Your time is very valuable. You should spend your time with people you love. So mahalo. Thank you for coming these three days. I always come to this if I can. I missed the third year, but I was pretty much in the bed that year. You know I mean? But the rest, to come here and be here with you raises my spirit. I can let go what Kalani wants. I want to know what you want. People are welcome to come to my house. And some of you I know have, <laughs> and you know, you come to my house, this is exactly who you're going to find. You come to a federal conference, it's the same guy you're going to find. You know, it doesn't change. That's because I'm interested in collaborating with you. I'm not worried about what Kalani wants, what Kalani needs, because Kalani knows that if he's actually collaborating with you and you're collaborating with him, then you're going to be interested in what Kalani wants and needs. So Kalani would trade away his one person fighting for what Kalani wants and needs. And he's going to fight for the 120 of you out there. And he's going to expect that 120 of you are going to fight for what Kalani wants and needs. So Kalani's not being altruistic, Kalani's being terribly private sector. <laughs> I'm trying to increase my potential. My potential depends on my collaboration with you. 
Sacrificing what I want is a very small price to pay to get your collaboration. So I'm going to park my ego, what I think I know, and I'm going to try to listen really deeply. What is it you want? And then I'm going to dig in, dig in. Now, why would I do that? See, Hawaiians, we think humans, the ua, the people, kapoe, as you said, all the brothers and sisters, we're the first things that came to the planet. We came on the first water. The water is older than the sun. The water don't come from this star. The water comes from a star system. It's kind of far away. And uh, in my adventures around the world, I found that there's a lot of indigenous cultures that point at that same star system, go, yeah, that's where we came from. How did that happen? Somebody's telling a monstrous global lie, or there's some little thing way underneath there. So we come to the planet first. We've been doing this time and time again. Nine million years of evolution in nine months inside the primordial sea. Ask any woman who's had a baby. They know in the water carriers. So they get our respect in Hawaii. The most precious thing is the old water carrier. You know, you guys know that. I've told you, old women to us are like, wow. Most beautiful flower, you know, lasted that long. How good is that, you know? Just to give you an idea how we're thinking about things, how my grandfather raised me around this collaboration, how you see other things. It's a world view. I can't put it down. I don't know how to. I don't know how not to see you as my sister or my brother. It's when I see people behaving in that other fashion, it pains me. I wonder why the rest of us don't feel that way, and I suspect that you do. You know. But like the people on that United Airlines flight, they were all outraged, but nobody stood up. I told you guys last night, they did that in 34, they did that in 36, they did it in 39, and we should not do it now. I'll stand up from this chair, you know what I mean? And that's what we gotta do. So I need your collaboration. What we need to do is dig down into ourselves, deep in our spirits. Know that we serve the seven generations. Know that each of us is related. That we're related to all things on the planet. And move in that knowing. We should not stay still. We should not wait for resources to appear. We should move. Migration. I was talking to somebody about that. There is no climate refugeeism. It's migration. Humans have been migrating since we started on this little ice ball. Everything migrates. Everything changes. That's the constant. It's always changing. That's another thing my grandfather told me. He was a really strange old man. He said, it's always changing, boy. That's why it's always the same. It's always the same. It's always changing. And he would just say stuff like that, just mumble. I thought, crazy Hawaiian man, you know. Now I'm like, oh, I see. It's like it's always changing. It's always the same. It's just changing. You know, I'm muttering like him, you know. So when the Sky Father had an affair with the woman that is the sea, that's the younger sister of the Earth Mother, they had an affair and life began in the tidal pools, the single-celled organism, the coral polyp, and there we are. You know what I mean? And we started this little journey. We ended up in this room here in Colorado. Now, 
Life multiplied in the sea, so plentiful, it crawled up onto the earth mother. The earth mother in her vengeance, she could have destroyed life right there. The betrayal of her consort, the sky father, with her kid sister, the woman that is the sea. Unbelievable. But the earth mother, instead, she embraces life. She multiplied it three times fold. She even put life back into the air so the Sky Father could enjoy what he had done. So we know if you value life, the first law is compassion. The first law. And we know that because the Earth Mother shows us that every day. I look in your eyes. When I pass you and I know life, it's affirming. It's real. Your earth mother has shown us this. Oh, and one other thing. If you get married, don't let your kid sister move into the house. <laughs> the lessons come as particles and as waves. Understand. We are both individuals and we are the collective. So I really appreciate the diversity. Look, I did a lot of diversity training myself, so that was a wonderful thing. But I want to caution us. Sometimes the crayons are so enamored of their own wrapping that they argue, whether it's the magenta or the fire engine red. You know, which one is important? And the box gets bigger and bigger. And me, I used to like that 500 crayon box. I never had one, but I saw the kids that did. And I thought, who, if I could catch them outside. <laughs> you know, but anyway, I digress. Might I suggest that it is about the painting and not the crayons? It's not even about the box the crayons come in. It's about what happens when the crayons do what they do in the right hand. So let's celebrate our colors. Let's understand that we're all one off. The way I think about it is like this. Everybody's a minority, a minority of one. No two fingerprints, no two leaves, no two grains of sand ever, ever the same. There'll never be another Melissa. That's a shame. You know what I mean? But, but man, that was wicked. And so, mahalo for coming here. I need your collaboration. We need to not give up. Seven generations depending on us. And if you don't think they are, I'm dependent on you. So I'll work for whatever it is you need. Whatever it is you think you're working for, whatever cause you got. I can see Julie, she's going, oh my God, stop it. You don't know I'm serious. <laughs> whatever you need help with, I'm there. I'll tell you right now. You know I me, mean? just like I told the swan girls when he said, nobody comes to last. I said, hey, I will. I'm there. You know what I mean? It's like, I'll come. It was great to go to Kivalina. Shame the Department of Interior. Make the secretary come afterwards. And then make the president come. And that chucklehead didn't even go to Kivalina. He only went halfway there and made them come to see him. Yeah. Cuts a view. That's as far as he could get. You know. We're all in this together. You got no choice. There's only one ocean. And you're breathing it right now. We're all in the biosphere. You guys all know it. Science, traditional knowledge, science. <laughs> Untraditional knowledge. You know, those ways to describe those ways of knowing. They're valid. When I want to know something, I ask my granddaughter, Junebug. She's about two years and two months. She's the smartest human being I've ever met. If I want to know something, 
She comes to my hallway, sits down on the bed with me, and I say, June, what's up? I said, thank you. Thank you. So I understand that interconnectivity, the intergenerational connectivity, the way we are with each other, the way it feels right now in this room, how can we fail? And if we do, just stand up. You? Mahalo, you guys, for putting up with my rantings. Mahalo, you guys, for putting up with us last night. I really appreciate those of you who were there. I thought that was a really interesting. And I want to thank Craig Elovich, who is my main collaborator. Uh, since we met 10 years ago and he came up into my driveway, whatever he needs, that's what I want to work for. And I trust Craig. Whatever I need, he's always got my back. Same like Paulette. You mean, I can't wait to Michelle is coming back and forth. That's going to be awesome. So I'm not kidding. You're welcome. You hit Hilo. You turn to the right. You follow the coast. Takes you about 43 minutes. You come to Anton Deleuze Road. You go past it where the yellow garbage cans are. You turn to the left where the stop sign is. It's a blue house with blue trim and a blue roof. It's beautiful. I'm the house right next door. <laughs> you can tell my house because you can't see it. The trees are all growing up around it. I live in a little forest. And uh, those of you who want to collaborate with us, we are with the Indigenous Phonology Network. In all seriousness, we're going to try and revive um, food capacities to try and return the first 72 hours of food capacity to families directly there on the ground. In the last three years, we've developed a 10 by 25 micro food forest that we now want to work with tribal colleges to regionalize. There must be temperate food forests. I've heard about them from the elders when I was my first exchange with the Cherokee up in Cumberland. I saw some of their stuff. And man, we was up at several thousand feet. So I know this can be done. It can be winterized. Uh, Alyssa has been working on this with us. We're really digging in. You guys are welcome to join the conversation. It's the first Tuesday of the month. We're doing a webinar and a, and a straight reach out. So if you can handle go to meeting, you can jump into the conversation. Mahalo, you guys. Appreciate Thank you, Kalani. Um, I think when Kalani is with us, it's always inspiration or maybe fuel for the fire. <laughs> um, but thank you as always. You know, you weren't with us the last time we were here in Boulder, but you are always with us. Um, and it's good to have you back. Um, and, uh, thanks for your time, everybody. I really appreciate it, even if nobody else does. So we have a slight change in the schedule that's on your agenda. I think um, in order to preserve our break times, which we have been sliding into a little bit, we're going to end um, a little early. Or no, OK. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. If anyone has anything, there are a couple of mics. Or if you have a loud voice, go ahead. community hasn't heard about this and so my question is is how what is the structure to reach out to tribal communities to get more presence at the UN especially towards the development goals so that we can be our own voices um, as we try to achieve these development goals what are the region you mentioned committee uh, committee members are there regional committee members I mean how is that structured to better represent Indian country well, th uh, thank you very much for that. Um, like anything, it's 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 a process, right? And um, you know, as you go through the process, there's growing pains, and uh, you know, you, like you say you can't please everybody, <laughs> but you you do what you can to to make the difference. And uh, you know, as a result of uh, lack of funding, right? 
We do what we can through social media to get the word out. But we also have to look at the responsibility our, ourselves. What responsibility do we have? There have been many indigenous peoples from North America, United States, participating at the UN since 1977. You know, and it's also up to them to get information out to other tribal nations here. And that includes NCAI, uh, National Congress of American Indians, or if you're in Canada, AFN. You know, these are re large regional organizations that reach out to many communities, and it's also up to them to get that information out. There's others as well. But uh, just to answer, as we're moving forward, we still don't have funding, but we're restructuring and, and, and uh, trying to do something. And we just um, affirmed uh, somebody who is willing to take on this work, because it, a lot of it is voluntary. And so uh, Mr. Kenneth Deer from the Mohawk community uh, will be taking on the regional outreach for North America. And we're actually at the permanent forum. We're going to be having a meeting uh, talking about regional outreach uh, within all the regions. Not, it's not just US, right? Not just North America, but there's folks in the Pacific, there's Arctic, et cetera, all the seven regions, geopolitical regions that we work with within the UN system. That information has to get out there. And you know, not everybody's on the internet. How do you reach folks? How do you connect with folks? And so these are real questions. These are real challenges. But you know, we just have to do it and get. So I'm, I'm very happy to get your information, uh, lead you to the, the, the listserv that we have. is called uh, uh, Indigenous Peoples Major Group. You can look that up, or, or we can just, you know, you could see me afterwards, and we could connect. But moving forward, we do plan for much more outreach and much more connection and much more uh, collaboration between indigenous peoples and our allies. Kakwa is always the first to be like, specifically, how are we going to do this? Because we're doing it. <laughs> uh, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, so my name is Erin Mars Madeira, and I uh, am with the Nature Conservancy. And I just wanted to share my my deep and sincere gratitude to you, Melissa, for sharing your experience. Um, you know, I know that um, it's you know it's not easy to get up and sort of share some of the challenges that you faced as you're also on your own kind of career path. Um, and I guess, you know, I, I want to share my gratitude, too, to, this, to the whole event and to all the panelists. I feel like with every presentation um, and conversation, I get a deeper awareness of the, my own mental models that I hold um, and my own sort of role, personal role and organizational role in um, both the opportunities that we have, but the shortcomings um, and, and where we have uh, stumbled in the past. And so, um, you know, what I take away from the great presentation you gave is, you know, this tension between the dialogue that I see internally on these issues and the gap between that's not being manifest in implementation. And, um, you know, I believe, and organizationally, you know, we're moving towards really thinking deeply about collaboration and what that means. And really, again, we're so deeply grateful for your feedback and really invite more of that to work with us to figure out how we can do it better. Um, because it's not your responsibility to fix it. You know, it's our shared responsibility. And so, again, you know, thank you, and let's figure out how we can move forward. Thanks. <laughs> Right behind you, yeah. Thank you, and thank you to all the panelists. Uh, your stories are, are beautiful, and, and thank you for sharing so much, and you're inspirational. Um, I had a question for Dr. Borrero. Um, in the development of the database about the different ways of food production and all the measures of, of gathering statistical data, how do you address or overcome the different ways, the different groups, different communities record data, record food production, record who has tenure rights or tenure responsibilities, with, beyond even just language differences, different ways of, of knowing, different ways of recording, oral traditions, different ways of um, mapping out how food production is accomplished in that community. How, for a national and even an international database, how do you deal with those differences? 
Well, thank you, and uh, I really think it's it's uh, sort of the same uh, response that it, that I just had. It's uh, it's an ongoing process, the SDGs, and it, it's it's not uh, myself that's that's in charge. The UN has a specific agency on those indicators, but they're asking for people to get involved in that, right? So, in other words. It's also up to people who are concerned with this and who are concerned with language. It like that's why we're there at the UN, right? To say, wait a minute, we, this doesn't this doesn't sound right according to what I know, and so that we link with other indigenous peoples who are saying, oh, that doesn't sound right with us either, and try to propose things uh, to these agencies and to bring this up, which is why we need more input. And so I'm just turning it back to you in that way, and that. that um, you know, this is a challenge. This is why some people are very uh, critical of the SDGs and the post-2030 agenda. And they see it as, you know, there's all kinds of um, theories and, and controver controversies around it. But this is what's happening now. This is the, the focus of the global agenda. So we all have to be aware of this. We all have to be concerned about it. And we have to get involved if we're really concerned about the future of this planet. One more question. Uh, I just sort of wanted to acknowledge, I think, a conversation that's beginning to emerge and is an important conversation for all of us, and I think it's why we're all here. And that is um, this conversation with working with the Nature Conservancy, the critique of experience um, from an indigenous perspective that Melissa offered in working with the Nature Conservancy. And um, certainly, as the Executive Director of Cultural Survival, uh, I've been several different types of, on an international scale of conservationist societies have reached out to us and said, we want to work with you. And you know, my initial response is to say, well, I don't know. You know, I, as an indigenous person, um, these experiences histor historically we've had with these conservation societies are very problematic and continue to be very problematic. Um, and, you know, could name a, no a number of examples um, why, you know, especially with sort of what's considered the big five um, worldwide. But at the same time, in the spirit of why we're here, I stepped back and said, well, wait a minute. The Nature Conservancy has reached out to us. So I reached back out to people like Erin and sort of, you know, throughout the system and said, let's have a conversation about this and help me to understand th the gesture you're putting forward and the work that you're doing. And it became very clear to me that, at least in terms of the Nature Conservancy, they planted a seed and um, they're trying to grow it and they're trying to water it and they're trying to understand um, how to do this work with indigenous peoples. And um, I also wanted to be very respectful of the indigenous communities they are working with. So I offered for the Nature Conservancy to bring some of the representatives from, their, um, from the communities that they're working with, um, indigenous communities, to this discussion. So we have, um, I think, two or three groups. Um, Elizabeth represents a collaborative effort with the Nature Conservancy, uh, uh, where Stan, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, just blanked your name, Edward from Tanzania, and then Stan and, I'm not sure where they are. Um, who are also here um, doing collaborative efforts um, in their communities um, with the Nature Conservancy. So I'm not up here to sort of offer a defense of the Nature Conservancy, but rather just to point out um, these are those difficult dialogues, these are those moments of tension, and we have to walk through them in order to arrive at some of the collaborative work we're doing. So thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I think that we have a couple of announcements, but before we get to announcements, if we could just thank our panel again for a great session.
Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, panel. That was amazing. Um, we do have a few announcements. Okay. Um, so the first one is that we're going to try, we're going to attempt a group photo. No, this, we are. We're not. <laughs> we're going to attempt to get everybody in the group photo. Um, we're going to have to get really cozy. We're going to do it right outside here in the lobby. Um, so that will be the first thing we do when we leave this room so we can do it efficient and fast and we're trying to get everybody there. We love to show these group photos on the website and presentations and, you know, all kinds of things. So hopefully you'll join us. Right outside in the lobby, there are some chairs to mark that we're trying to get inside of the boundary of those chairs. Face east, which is away from this room in that direction, and get really cozy and cuddle up, get to know each other really well. We'll try to take a really quick photo. Jamie's going to take it. He'll be up on the balcony above us looking down, so look up. Um, that's the first thing. The second is we will try to show, start the film. We'll still explain the breakouts. OK. Julie's going to talk about the film in just a moment. Um, we will go after the break, which um, is starting after the photo, we will go straight into the breakout groups. Um, so, <laughs> excuse me, join the breakout group that you were part of yesterday so that conversation can continue. Um, we will do the breakout groups through until 12. The moderators, uh, facilitators can let folks know at noon to run down to the cafeteria, get food. If you want to continue talking over food with each other, go for it. Um, please be back in your breakout groups. Those continue in the same places at 1 p.m. And I think the breakout groups can probably just meet where they were um, yesterday if that was working for you. If you want to change it up, go outside, that's fine as well. Um, let's see. We will, again, have a break at uh, 2.30. And then at 3, convene back in this room, please. Um, if you take your food with you to your breakout group room, which is fine since it takes so long to get through the cafeteria, just make sure that your plates end up back in the cafeteria, please. Um, and then, let's see, we'll come back here by 3 o'clock. Um, for the breakout groups, for the questions, you know, the questions we had, if you didn't get through them yesterday but you felt like there were more that you wanted to talk about, feel free to use yesterday's um, questions and then otherwise the session two questions are in today's agenda. But the questions are really guidelines. They're sort of focusing questions to um, help the conversations flow. But if your group or your conversations are going in other important directions, um, don't feel beholden to these questions. Please follow what's important to the conversation. Um, quick note for phonology. Since you guys were a large group yesterday, um, if you would like to, we're thinking breaking into two groups. So one group go back to 3031 where you were upstairs, and the other group can be in the south end of this room, at least to meet. If you guys decide to migrate elsewhere, that's fine. Um, Jeff Morissette will lead the new phonology group. So just kind of self-organize into two groups. That would be wonderful. Um, film. Um, yeah, and just to kind of iterate what Heather said about the questions too, like just really kind of think of these as prompts and we want your conversation to flow in those important directions you think it needs to go. So please go with it as you will, especially as it relates to your particular theme or topic. Um, yeah, I just wanted to follow up for the film that uh, Ava introduced yesterday um, when we had asked for feedback and acknowledging this is kind of the rough cut. So I realized we should probably say the purpose of the film. Um, and I was thinking uh, uh, two weeks ago, we organized a community workshop in New Mexico, and a lot of the conversation was around things like how um, topics and issues like the long walk are not in history books, right? And so the purpose of this film is to talk about what's not in those history books. And actually, a major audience for this film isn't necessarily the people here, but it's to get it into education, to classrooms, and particularly for NGOs and organizations for trainings and understandings and so we really appreciate having an audience like this to think about that feedback for what it looks like to tell these stories to people who have no prior awareness understanding or knowledge of this um i wrote my notes so real quick um one thing i didn't do yesterday is i really wanted to acknowledge a few folks here um so bob goff who is part a big part of this brainstorming for how to do this bob rabin just raise your hand. 
He was amazing and taking my ridiculous like 5 a.m. phone calls and like crying, can you like put up some elders tonight at like one in the morning, they're gonna walk into your place and just accommodated um, Paulette, who, wherever she is, she like opened her house, even like when there was no AC, everything had gone out, it was like 110 degrees, I showed up with like 25 of us and she was just like, let's do it. She set up an amazing time for us in Oklahoma. We met with Casey Camp Horneck, which was just like mind-blowing experience. Um, and Ava, in particular, who I reached out to and I was like, I don't really know where we're going. I don't know how we're gonna get there and I really don't know how this is gonna work. Do you wanna come? And she's like, no hesitation. Oh, I'm there, cool, let's do it. Um, so thank you for your leap of faith. Um, and so it'd be great. We'll play, we'll play the film after the photo and then twice during the lunch and then um, during the later breakout. So just, I just wanted to kind of throw it out, out there to hopefully elicit some feedback from you all to help us kind of finalize this product. Thank you. All right, so let's, let's do the group photo the faster, the more quickly we do the group photo, the more quickly we can come in and start the film. So see you out there. 